uh, we have had many conversations with with uh, with Don and with Dan and everybody else who's been kind of organizing this about what are the best issues that we could address. I think that it benefits architects to know Don's perspective on growth and Don's perspective in particular about uh, uh, equity and 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 in the city of Denver. Why? Because. Um, I think that architects should not take a backseat to the issues. We are, in a way, very much responsible for being, in a way, advocates or at least active in the decision of how growth is. I cannot condone that architects may just allow their clients to dictate how growth is, that architects have a responsibility to uh, actually influence that process, whether it is with their clients or whether it is in the public arena. Um, so I would like to to pass it down to to Dan um, and uh, just uh, get us get us going. I think that we'll be having a pretty much uh, conversation until uh, we decide to open it for questions. Dan. Well, thank you, Ignacio. Sorry you're not feeling well, but uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I'll return the favor. Ignacio does bring, has brought um, a, a great design sensitivity and a design lens to work on the planning board, which sometimes doesn't have a lot of that advocacy. Uh, Denver has a very unique zoning system. We decided when we set this up, but I do thank you for inviting me and I, I thank you for bringing that perspective uh, throughout my tenure on the board. I am now off the, the planning board. But by way of introduction, just so you know, my firm Clarion Associates is a small consulting firm and we do community plans. Uh, we are not transportation planners, but we do neighborhood plans, corridor plans, sustainability plans, housing plans. And our clients are uh, cities and counties. We work for public sector entities. And within that, we also are one of the firms around the country that's known for drafting development codes. So uh, the hat I wear, as, as uh, Ignacio said, is as a zoning guy. I am not a designer. As a matter of fact, when I finished my first job between college and planning school, um, my boss, which was with an architectural firm in New Orleans, my boss told me at the end, he said, Don, if you could draw, you'd be useful. And so uh, I am not a designer. I don't pretend to be a designer. I don't play one on TV. I'm a, I'm a lawyer and a planner, and I write those laws uh, that tell you what you can build and where you can build it and what the city will reward you to build and how much process you have to go through to get a yes. That's that's by way of background. And so um, I also teach a course on land use, uh, excuse me, land development regulation at the University of Colorado at Denver. And again, for the last six years, I was on the planning board, although I am term limited off as of July 1. But I'm very grateful to be invited. Um, I guess what I'd like to talk about, we agreed when we set this up, it's not just the city of Denver, it is a Denver metro area. And it's important that you know that because Denver's rules on zoning and subdivision and development review and approval are very different than all of those around it. Now, all the suburbs, even the big ones, Aurora, Thornton, Lakewood, they're all different from each other, but they are much sim more similar to each other than they are to Denver. Denver is the outlier. And so we'll have to be careful as we have this discussion because I wanna talk really about the Denver metro area. Two thirds of the people in the Denver metro area don't live in the city and county of Denver. They live in the Denver metro area. And so uh, I, in terms of equity, I'd like to kick it off. This is a hot topic uh, in planning right now. And to be very blunt, it's because over the past couple of years, before George Floyd, but amplified by George Floyd, uh, is based in a book by Richard Rothstein called The Color of Law. We have become increasingly aware that the rules of zoning and subdivision and design review and development approval, all the governmental functions that have to do with cities, are have inherent biases in them. They have a lot of inherent biases in them. When you go back and see their roots, it is a little scary how much you could draw a dotted line between zoning and redlining and zoning in overtly anti-Black and anti-minority uh, uh, laws that were passed in the early part of the 20th century, which were ruled illegal. But you could almost draw a dotted line that says, well, when the court said you can't do that, the planners and the others said, well, how about this? We will zone to make cities nicer 
And in the process of nicer, we will keep poor people out of places where we don't want poor people. And by the way, we also have a generalized understanding that that would include a lot of minorities. I'm sorry to have to say that so bluntly, but they, that is why planners have been very concerned about this over the past years. And I would just say in general, um, this issue of equity needs to be discussed as race and ethnicity in particular, but also women-headed households and disabilities um, and affordability, but it's not the same issue. We're gonna talk about affordability later. But when you make more affordable housing available, you do disproportionately benefit those groups I just mentioned, racial and ethnic minorities, women-headed household, the disabled, others, because those groups very demonstrably make a lot less money in our economy than white majority to, uh, to household, uh, to earner families. So when you focus on affordability, you have an indirect influence on opening up more opportunities for racial and ethnic minorities, but it's not enough because when you stop there and say, well, if we make it more affordable, it'll be more fair for all the people who get kind of shortchanged in American society. No, because sometimes when you do that, the people who benefit are actually, they are lower income, but they are also majority white, lower income to earner families. That's a good thing, but it doesn't do anything to advance the needle on racial and ethnic equity. So that is why Denver and other cities are struggling with how much you get into this through affordability and how much through equity. Last points I'll make before kind of turning it back to Ignacio are as Zoners and planners think about this. We think about it from three perspectives. One is engagement. How do you get a broader group of people, and in particular, racial and ethnic minorities, people with low income, um, to the table to help make the rules, administer the rules, enforce the rules, raise their hands when the rules are unfair, because uh, participation rates in those groups are very low. So there's a people part of the problem. And often the conversation stops there. Oh, we don't do a good job reaching the right people. That's true, very true, uh, but it's not enough. The second part is the rules themselves, what you can build, how good it has to be, how well it has to be designed, how well it has to be landscaped, how much parking you have to provide. All of those things have impacts on racial and ethnic minorities, lower income families, anybody who is a disabled and the disabled. So it is not just enough to say that it's a people engagement problem. It is a substantive rule problem, which we're trying to solve. And it's a mapping problem because when you stare at zoning maps in your left hand and redlining maps in your right hand, they look a lot similar in many cities. And so there is also a question, does fairness require a serious discussion about changing the zoning map if only, if, if only because of its inherent Right, not just just overt the equity issues. And what this is, the reason this is so hard for planners is it's kind of an existential problem for planners. Planners go to school to get master's degrees to learn how to make cities better. And as you make them better, you often make them more exclusive. And that has direct equity implications on racial and ethnic minorities. It raises this question. Are there parts of the city, are there ways in which we should not be trying to make the city better? That we should be protecting those areas that should not be improved because when you improve them, you have just poured gas on gentrification. You can guarantee that the people who most want to live there and can afford to live there will not be able to live there in the future. And we've seen this in planning in the last 10 years where neighborhoods start the planning process saying, we'd like all the good things the nice neighborhoods have. And partway through they say, wait, did we say that? We do not want the nice things the nice neighborhoods have because that can only raise rents and land prices and I will not be able to live here when we're done. So that's the kind of equity hand-wringing and, and difficult conversations planners are having. But I'd be interested in hearing Ignacio look at it from a, a design and architectural perspective. Well, actually, uh, you know, we have talked about this quite a bit, but uh, one new question comes to mind and it's like, have we actually gone past the point of no return? Uh, I mean, we look at what's happening in Denver today, uh, the incredible amount of people that are on the streets that is related to, to this inequity in a way, but many other factors. 
Uh, and then we look at the uh, traditional neighborhoods, uh, Elyria, Swansea, and so on, which were really close to uh, the city center um, and so on, which become really desirable uh, neighborhoods that are now suffering that pressure of uh, gentrification. Um, so uh, I, I guess my my question is: are, are we are we past the point of no return? Um, and, and then we, I don't think that we are pretty much a uh, uh, an engaged society. Our advocacy is not strong enough to to actually uh, really protect the uh, uh, the people that that need to be protected are not being protected. So um, let's talk about that for a minute and then I'll come back to another thought. Well, if the question's to me, I, I, I my general feeling in planning is that I often run into situations where people say, uh, it's too late, the cow's out of the barn uh, and you can't fix this problem. And the answer is usually when you look back 20 years later, you say, well, we should have done something anyway, because it got worse. If we'd acted, then we could have mitigated this damage. So I, I tend to generally think no matter how bad it is, it, it's almost, you need to do something uh, or you will find it is worse and worse. And, and what's happening is we're, we're living through the suburbanization of poverty. Um, okay. Lower income folks are being pushed out to, well, to from Denver, from Swansea, Illyria, to Northwest Aurora to various neighborhoods in Thornton and some neighborhoods in, in, in uh, Englewood and in, in, in Lakewood. And we can't just stand, I, if we intend to do that, okay. But I've never heard anybody say we intend to do that. Okay. And I do think it's a problem. A lot of the social services, a lot of the transit are in the center parts of the metro area. And it would be a rare planning decision to say, you know what we need to do? Everybody wants to say, and I actually had an elected official say this to me a couple of years ago. I'd like the rich people to move in, but I don't want the poor people to move out. Well, that ain't gonna happen, not without serious government intervention. When the rich come in, they outbid the poor, the poor move out. And we've set into motion forces that are forcing the poor to move further away from social services, further away from transit, arguably towards some jobs in a way others. But my point is we can watch this happening. We are watching it happen. And so I don't think it's too late. I think it's almost a moral obligation, Ignacio, to say uh, yeah. it may be too late, but we're not going to sit there and watch it just unfold excellent. and say, well, what could we do? So, Oh, excellent. And that is really the, the answer that I was looking. And then that can become the corollary to uh, architects to really take a stand because we have actually been very active and very successful on a number of legislative issues uh, in the state of Colorado, we we get behind our colleagues and we try to protect uh, our colleagues from uh, issues that relate to uh, 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 construction and so on. But really, we have not taken a stance, at least publicly, on on the issues that relate to to uh, to equity and and so on. Uh, so. Uh, I think this this is this is more than anything a uh, a call to my colleagues to start looking into that because um, even though there are like you look at and I'm I'm most familiar with the city of Denver so you look at the city of Denver host which is the uh, the the housing uh, department for uh, sustainable uh, I don't know what it stands for host. Uh, uh, housing office for, uh, well, whatever. It, it doesn't matter. It's, it's basically uh, trying to create equity in housing. And the tools that the, the city has are very limited. Um, and when you look at who is developing affordable housing today, which is actually, uh, well, we can talk about ADUs and we can talk about uh, affordable housing as well. But when, when you're looking at affordable housing, there are very few people, very few developers who are doing it. Uh, and the, all those developers are for profit, except for uh, an even smaller handful of those. Uh, there are nonprofit organizations that are doing the vertical development as well. Um, now, obviously, 
architects cannot say, hey, look, I just do what my client does and, and, and so on. That is why the importance of the advocacy can change the panorama for the, uh, for the architects and how we practice and how we, we can influence. In terms of ADUs, that is also being seen a little bit as a panacea that, oh, we can solve the health problem by uh, creating ADUs. And I think, yeah, that can help. Uh, and my position in the board has been in the planning board in the city of Denver and, and uh, uh, obviously other municipalities are kind of dealing with that. And we can talk about single family in a little bit, but it's basically that can help, but it is so expensive that it's not going to really make a, a big dent on, on it. Um, I graduated from uh, graduate school at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in uh, 1992, and my thesis was actually a development model for Walker's Point West in Milwaukee, which is pretty much if uh, similar to Elyria Swansea. And the idea was to allow for the multiplicity of housing without changing uh, the, the households and creating additional dwelling units or multiple occupants in one unit. So um, we have changed in the city of Denver, the, uh, the number of uh, uh, people who can live in one single family uh, residence, but uh, I, I guess we're still there. So uh, we're still trying to uh, get us ourselves to a more equitable. So do our, well, for the city of Denver, but also for the uh, the suburbs, are we are we getting there uh, in a healthy manner? Is advocacy along for architects uh, sufficient? What else would be missing? So I guess let's just take it towards affordability. I'm going to pick up from there um, and make two or three points, and then I think in the interest of time, I'll try to keep it short so we can have more time for discussion among the other folks in the in the group. But um, I guess I focus on kind of two numbers. One is 5%. Uh, the nation's economy and Denver itself doesn't grow the housing stock very much. It seems like we're growing like crazy, but it's a small percentage of the housing stock. And most of the time, I've seen numbers two, three, four, five percent 5% expansion of housing each year. Now, if somebody wants to say it's really 15% in Denver, I'll be surprised, but I don't think it is. And the point is, yes, you're adding units, but you're also retiring old units. You lose units when you get them. And when you replace a bungalow with a McMansion, that's not a new unit. That's not an additional unit. That's just a different unit. So I, I, my, my tagline is, if we can't build ourselves out of the affordability problem, new construction doesn't happen fast enough to bring prices down and new construction is very expensive. Therefore, the second number is, 50% to 70%, but in Denver metro area, maybe 50% at a minimum of the land is in single family housing. And you need to address that or you can't get at the affordability problem. I think there are a lot of people who won't say it in words, but they really hope we could solve this without changing the character of any of our single family neighborhoods. That is saying, I'm gonna tackle one of the most serious economic problems of this country with one hand tied behind my back. The rule is, None of us who've made it in America and have individual houses on lots in stable neighborhoods have to change. Somebody else has to change. That's not fair and it's not right. And it, and it's, it is forcing you to try to solve a very difficult problem with only half the tools. So that is why we're seeing California, Oregon, Washington, other places, Minnesota, allow two and three and fourplex units in um, in single family neighborhoods. And we're gonna see more of that and ADUs. All of that's gonna happen. What I call that is, that's the broad solution. Most neighborhoods, perhaps with the exception of truly historically designated neighborhoods with a, uni uni with a unique character, need to be part of the solution because you can't give up 50% of the land that's available and 50% of the structures that have already been built with money that was paid for in 1960 or 70 or 80. That's old money. That's You may have to convert the attic, the basement. You have some new construction, but it's not like trying to build a brand new building today. So uh, A, it has to be shared across the entire metro area, meaning there's nobody who's held harmless from change that needs to happen for affordability. And B, there just isn't enough money. to there. We don't expand the housing stock. 
And frankly, for lower income populations, there ain't enough money and there will never be enough money to subsidize people at the 30, 40, 50% of area median income. So you need to open up opportunities for the private market to do what it can't do today. And that means use the 50% of the land that's now in single family zoning to help house more people. That's, 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 the, that's the math. Uh, when you deny that, you kind of say, well, let's imagine money. Let's imagine 20% housing growth in 10 years or five years. Not gonna happen. So uh, I kind of deal a lot with cities in reality of look, it, everybody's gonna have to change. And the question is in what way, what do we allow to have change? So I, I think we are gonna, we're gonna have to see, I'm working now in Boise, I'm working in Bozeman, I'm working, I don't work for the city and county of Denver, but I work for some of the suburbs. I work for Colorado Springs everybody's facing exactly the same reality and either they deny it or they accept it and they have a serious conversation about it. Yeah, well, and what about transit corridors? Uh, you know, when before I came to work for RTD, I was a critic of the uh, Fast Tracks program because it was putting uh, the tracks where there was no density, yeah. Um, and it seemed to me, and maybe still the case, that uh, it was a, a compromise between 27 municipalities and seven counties to get a transit system that would serve everybody. And, uh, and then obviously the rail would be where the rail tracks were before and so on. So we ended up with a system in which we have a, uh, a, a, a train system in many uh, lightly populated areas. Nonetheless, we have the, uh, we have the, uh, the Central Park Station that actually I think it has a lot of potential. When we had the AIA convention here in Denver a few years ago, and uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, panelists was talking about uh, the uh, development around the station, which was actually just a, a block away from the from the parking. Every architect raised their hand and said, "Hey, wait a minute! What about the parking lot that is between your development and the station?" Yeah. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, th there are a lot of those issues, but um, I think the biggest one for me uh, is the, uh, the Colfax Corridor. Um, and uh, not only in Denver, but in other places, we have a lot of arterial corridors that are served by transit. The 15L is the busiest uh, bus line in the RTD system. Uh, it didn't see a much uh, drop in ridership in the during the pandemic, and yet our plan for for density around or along the corridor is is not. I don't think it's optimal. It has very big challenges, which is well, you cannot go deeper than one parcel because then you run into single family and so on. Um, Don, what, what, what is your thought about that? How can we really make uh, arterial corridors in the Denver metro area uh, more transit oriented? Well, we, we, have, uh, we, have, we have talked so far about equity and affordability. Sustainability didn't go away. You know, climate change did not go away. Every RFP that I have seen in the last 20, 15 years says, help us create a more sustainable city. And they mean lower vehicle emissions, lower carbon footprint, a uh, lot of, they mean a lot of things. But at a minimum, that's what they mean. So we have this kind of three-legged stool. We have equity going on, which has some very hard decisions. We have affordability and we have sustainability. Um, Denver actually, the city of Denver does a lot very well compared to national uh, other big cities at getting density near transit. That's what our plan said before Blueprint Denver, the latest one, and it now says it the same way. Um, as a matter of fact, that's what some of the public angst is about. Is where did all these three and five and seven and 20 story, 12 story buildings come from? Answer, Denver says, if we say it belongs there because density belongs near transit, it will happen. Well, when do I get a hearing about it? You don't, it gets rezoned. And if it's consistent with the plan, it'll be what it needs to be. We've done really, I think, 
very well compared to most. Most cities would have a debate about every single building. When I get uh, uh, planners from California coming in and I'm saying, guess how many hearings that had to go through? And the answer was, well, I'm sure there was a rezoning hearing and then a, probably a design review hearing and a, and a, you know, and a, and a, and a conditional use hearing. I'm saying, no, there was a rezoning hearing and then they built it. Now, I don't want to simplify it, but that's a, that's a very powerful system. Denver's doing well on that where we didn't do well is that uh, I think is that we should have back in the day when we rezoned the city been much more uh, aggressive about trying to do everything we could to require affordable housing in those areas because we're getting yeah it's dense it is it is dense but it's not affordable now one hand was tied behind our back there because we didn't have the right to do rental inclusionary zoning we now do as of the last legislative session so that has been solved and i'm sure denver is all over that i know they are but the point is uh, we we did we score really well on getting housing near rail we got a long way to go but we're doing well compared to a lot of places that housing is not affordable and the people who need it most are the affordable are the low income parts and so uh we can i guess the answer to your question in australia is we could be very aggressive about using the new powers that denver has gained through the legislature to do rental inclusionary zoning it won't solve the problem Inclusionary zoning means I'll charge the rich people more in order to subsidize the poor people in my building. There's only so much of economics that will support. So in the end, you're going to need money. But in fact, uh, it is a, a key part of saying, OK, we're not just going to up zone and say it's fine with us if only rich people near live near these transit lines. We are going to require a greater percentage of it to be. Don, I have hey, a question. Oh, go ahead, Ignacio. No, no, I, I saw your, your question right there, so go ahead. Well, um, maybe taking a step back, or I've been taking notes and want to encourage other folks to go ahead and um, offer anything through the chat or just, you know, voice a question or thought here. That's great. Uh, that's where we're at. So, Don, the question to you that I have is, what would you say is the next step that Denver could take um, and I'm, I'm going back to your comment about um, change needs to occur across the board and um, private uh, development is how we're going to, is the best way we can get to a more affordable solution. So in Denver, I guess, or in any municipality, what's one thing that we could do, you know, this calendar year that you think would at least begin to move the needle? That's one question that I have a follow up. Uh, there are two. I'll, I'll give you two. One is what I just said. Um, Denver needs to aggressively move forward on the inclusionary housing zone uh, ordinance to say things like they had a one off at 38th and Blake that said we'll let you do much bigger buildings here. Here we're zoning for density around transit and we will do much bigger buildings if you give us affordability. It didn't work as well as they thought, but they need to do that on a citywide basis so that the up zonings are, are accompanied. And B, we need to get away from uh, one-off zonings for ADUs. AD, ADUs, accessory dwelling units, will not solve the problem, but they are a fundamental part of the, of the solution because they happen gradually and continually over time. Is it expensive? Yes. Will everybody do it? No. But it's like a flywheel in the background where over time, individual property owners over 50% of hundred square miles, that's 50 square miles of land in Denver, in Denver alone would be, have that opportunity and little by little it will happen. And those are just continual, it is a continual leavening of the housing stock in those neighborhoods. So um, I would like to see Denver move away to allow more two and three and four units in the lower density uh, zone districts. But, you know, it's interesting for a quote unquote form based code, which it really is compared to most cities. It also has a, an awful lot of use controls, meaning a whole category of things called single family use. Right. Um, there are I, in other cities I work, they say low density zoning. And I say, good, allow duplexes in there, threeplexes in density that would work in Denver. That would require kind of a pulling apart of the framework of the zoning because it says single family, two family multifamily and uh, it's built on that foundation which is form based but with a heavy dose of and you will not see low density housing much different than what you live in right now uh, built into it and that's that's a break uh, that's a foot on the break great thank you I, I suppose the follow up and it's kind of related Ignacio to the question I answered in the chat you, so, uh, someone made a comment about how uh, we may need to at some point acknowledge that we can't improve neighborhoods because therefore it will be gentrified. 
And I just wanted to sort of push back a little bit. And I know you're being provocative. Is, is there not a way to improve, quote, improve uh, areas, maybe build better schools or better infrastructure without necessarily gentrifying? Maybe there's a financial vehicle that assists. I have, I have no idea, but can you respond to that? Is that for me or for Ignacio? Either one. Uh, I'd like to, to hear from you first and then I'll, I'll... Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't want to admit it can't be done. I, I just want us to admit that that is what's likely to happen. People kind of look the other way. Why aren't we making it nicer? Yeah. And all these people that, that you thought you were making it nicer for are not the people who are going to experience the niceness. Um, yes, there are a couple of ways. In brief, um, you we could and some places do require that some level of the of the new development that takes place in those areas is affordable you basically require that instead of building mcmansions or building high-end luxury units that you're going to have to build a certain amount of those as affordable some places give a uh, priority to the existing neighborhood residents to move back into whatever's built on the coasts they do that aggressively i know some places that say not only can Don, if Don gets moved out of his house because it's been redeveloped for whatever, condos, probably higher density, Don has a first right to come back and live for the rest of his life. He will not be evicted. He has a right to rent at that level, inflating only with the cost of living for as long as he feels like staying there. Now, I don't predict Denver will do that. I'm not sure I rec I don't recommend it actually. But um, my point is you can give a priority. The experience is it doesn't work very well. Um, most people, if you say it's gonna take us two years to take down your bungalow and build something nicer here, by that time, the two years over, your kids are in another school, you're in another job, you've formed habits, you're not gonna move back to that neighborhood. So it, you can do it. Uh, the last thing I will mention is something Denver really hasn't gotten into yet, and that is community benefits agreements. Um, again, on the coast and places that have been struggling with this issue of gentrification for longer than we have, it has become kind of typical to say the neighborhood gets you, you negotiate a neighbor your zoning is contingent or accompanied by not just an affordable housing agreement but a community benefits agreement meaning you will hire at least 10 percent of the people on this construction job from a mile of the construction job you will uh, hold off 10 percent of your retail and office spaces for people who have lived and worked in the community for at least 10 years the point is you know, we look at it and say, that's not zoning, that's kind of social engineering and contracts. Well, in, in older places on the coast, they've kind of said, yeah, but that's what the neighborhood wants. You know, if you're, you're, you're setting in motion the gentrification. You didn't intend to kick them out or hurt them. So make a deal, make a deal that will minimize the degree to which you hurt them. And, and you know who cuts that deal? Not us, but other places say, why don't you talk to them about what they need out of this deal? So. Yeah, that was uh, going to be my point that, so one of the jobs I had before coming to, to Denver in Chicago was uh, as a community organizer in Southeast Chicago with a uh, company, a nonprofit called the Center for Neighborhood Technology. And uh, uh, basically the, the uh, the role of the advocacy planner is is that of uh, and Southeast Chicago, you have to realize that it's a, a very taxed uh, uh, in terms of environmental challenges uh, place because you had all the abandoned steel mills and a whole bunch of uh, really heavy industries, the highest density of Superfund sites uh, in the country and, and so on. So it is uh, an issue of uh, uh, community organizing and a grassroots movement. So how can architects uh, help there? I think that architects can provide, uh, facilitate that forum. Yeah, we can, we can really start talking about those issues and allow our, uh, our members to uh, be there mostly for listening and facilitating that conversation. Um, there are some communities that are well organized, but if you look at many communities uh, at the composition, especially in the neighborhoods that are under threat of gentrification, you look at them and most of the neighborhood organization leaders are the newcomers. Yeah. So uh, that is a challenge. Um, so uh, go ahead, uh, Dan. 
Well, you kind of brought us back to one of Don's first points about community engagement being uh, critical to improving equity and affordability. And I guess it makes me wonder how. You said architects could be part of that solution. How can you know what's a good example you can think of where that was done really well or really thoughtfully? <laughs> well, I don't know if I can come up with a really good uh, example, but let me tell you this. When, when I came to the planning board uh, was when uh, our colleague uh, Brad Buchanan was the director of planning, right? And uh, he's an architect and he used to tell architects, and I hope he still does, that uh, we need to get a seat on the table, that we need to put our names forward and say, I want to be part of this discussion. And uh, we as architects have the responsibility of uh, getting engaged in all this, because otherwise we can fly under the radar, uh, radar and uh, be completely uh, uh, unseen and make good money and retire happily and so on and never uh, be part of a community. But I don't think that is really uh, our whole mission. Our whole mission is, well, as Don was talking about planners, is to make better cities, right? I don't think our mission is just to make better architecture. I think we are also part in that uh, making better cities uh, uh, challenge. I would all just add in terms of engagement from our, from my perspective of not the design, but the planning profession. Um, it takes, it is taking more money, more of the budgets that cities and counties put into revising their development rules to try to be more equitable and affordable and to balance that on sustainability is going, is having to go into uh, uh, engagement. Uh, good examples are the big cities that I've worked with recently, um, Albuquerque, um, uh, uh, Aurora would, did well, Philadelphia did well, but they did hundreds of meetings and D Denver did hundreds of meetings when it does Blueprint Denver. That's numbers, that helps because yeah, basically when, when I work on this, we say anytime anybody says, I want you to come out and brief my neighborhood and give us a comment, you have to say yes. You have to say yes and you have to show up at the end of the day with a lot of numbers. But it tends to be, if you're not careful, the same old people, not the same old people, they vary, but they are tend to be people who have the time to engage in local government. So the, I think the cutting edge these days is kind of one-offs, but we can't get, I'm making this up, we can't get a good president of an organization or homeowners in this low income or minority area. Um, so we are going to just ask around, who do we know in that neighborhood who cares about it? And we're going to talk to them about what they think. And then we're going to ask them who else we should be talking to. That's highly labor intensive. But the people who almost have the biggest stake in a lot of the gentrification, affordability, equity issues are not people who are going to show up. They're not going to show up at a meeting and they're not going to show up electronically. My experience with virtual engagement during COVID is the numbers went up. I'm not sure the diversity went up at all. And so that means you can't just say, oh, the numbers are up. We must be reaching a broader spectrum. So that, and then one other thing, Lakewood has been an innovator in doing uh, public hearings a different way. They have staff record their presentation a week in advance, put it out there, and they find that, it, and then they play that recording at the public meeting for whoever's there. But a week in advance, you can hear what the case is, you can comment on it. At the meeting, they, were, they tell you what comments have been received so far. After the meeting, they leave it open for a while to before they make a decision. And you that window of opportunity, and the fact that you that you don't have to be anywhere at a particular time. I've talked to two communities now that say that is making a difference in the diversity of who participates here. That that we are getting people who get different perspectives and are not kind of more of the same people who generally show up at public hearings. So that's that's one of the cutting edges, I think. Well, that's a really, really great insight. Thank you both. Uh, I think we're, we're kind of coming to the end here on time. I'm still kind of monitoring the chat. I have still other folks. I have one more question if I could. Don, you've mentioned that um, a couple of things I think allude to a similar point. 
that zoning maps can and arguably should change if we want to move the needle. They have to change from what they were in the past. And you've also said that all parts of Denver and these singled out single family residences and neighborhoods need to be part of that solution. So two things, I guess I feel like I hear you're saying, a, a thought and a question, is that if we were able to provide more density in single family neighborhoods, that might offer affordable housing and more opportunity to live without always redeveloping um, other neighborhoods and gentrifying them. Is that a fair thing to hear? Yes, that's right. And then the, I guess the question is, again, uh, is there an example around the US where you know, maybe they did the hard work to just tell their neighbor, their single family residents is you guys need to be part of the solution here, not the problem. Well, again, the state of uh, Oregon did that recently. They kind of said, read our lips. If, you, if your zoning ordinance says single family, it allows one to four units. Um, if you go to court and try to enforce single family and, and uh, tell your neighbor he can't build that two unit complex, the courts are now going to tell you the state of Oregon's law doesn't, doesn't do that anymore. So that was state directed? Uh, that state. And then it was followed up with some similar legislation from the city of Portland. But, and the city of Minneapolis has done that. And, you know, this is kind of under the radar, but the state of California has told everybody if you've got single family zoning, henceforth, that means single family zoning, including two ADUs, if you want. One internal to your unit, small, and one on a, on a detached structure. And the reason they did it is I, I, I don't, these were very difficult decisions, politically very difficult. They did it, to be very honest, because the power of privileged single family and low density neighborhoods to keep out change is extreme. And no matter what these state governments have done, it almost takes state action to come in there and say, you know, we see what's going on. We, we see what you're doing here. And the state is paying too high a price for your protection of neighborhood character. And so we are gonna tell you from the state's point of view, just as we have zoning enabling laws, we're gonna tell you, you need to liberalize what you're allowing in your service. And it's, is it mean, feels mean, is it undemocratic? Well, it's not local control, but it's state control. You elected those guys and those guys looked around the state and said, something's gotta change. And, and we're kind of tired of you guys finding every excuse you can not to change. So I think that's what's going on. There's a couple of faces showing up. So Vicky, it looks like you have a question. Oh yeah, uh, I just wanted to say thank you guys for um, bringing up this conversation. I'm actually based in Portland, Oregon. And <laughs> so I, I appreciated your last comment. I did want to say that I do feel like uh, Oregon's um, housing crisis and our homelessness crisis was, you know, buckling. Uh, we were buckling under the, the issues of that before the state stepped in and made a change. And I think that being proactive before that happens um, could, you know, really help you guys. Um, I'm, I, you know, my office does building code accessibility fire protection. So we do a lot of accessibility for affordable housing projects in Seattle, Portland, uh, we have, you know, we've been in Denver for about three years. And uh, Portland actually did a couple of things that I thought were different. One, we have a grant that's running from the 1980s mayor that's funding a lot of these projects uh, or housing programs. So, you know, that's how Portland is funding a lot of these and they are working with nonprofits as um, Ignacio said, that's where a lot of our clients are are working with them to put in these affordable housing projects. And um, an interesting thing that we see a lot of our clients do is they combine the services with the housing. So when they put up a, a tower for you know residential low-income families, the first floor is meal services, education services, job services. Um, so wherever that building is placed, um, the community has access to to everything that they need. So that's something interesting that I've seen recently that I just wanted to bring up for you guys. Thanks, Vicki. Wells, did you have a, a question? I didn't, Dan. I've, I've enjoyed this conversation. I wanted to just 
sort of offer some thoughts at the end here. Really to thank uh, you, Ignacio, and, and Don, too. It's been enlightening. Um, in practice, I don't do any residential, and but yet, you know, I'm observing, we're in the, in the sort of private sector completely, but we just don't do any residential. So while I'm sensitive and aware of the issues that have been discussed today, I, I don't admittedly have a great contextual understanding for how to get us out of this. So these insights have, have been appreciated. Um, and it hit on, this discussion hit on some of the things that I was hoping it would, and that is the idea of ADUs. How do we break through that sort of 50% threshold of single family, the newer zoning code, I guess, uh, and what needs to happen there to sort of affect change in this space. Um, you know, I don't think this is relevant. It's probably gonna show my ignorance, if anything, but, you know, I've been hearing, and I have nothing to substantiate it, that there's been a lot of like, investor sort of big you know big financial investing that has has been sort of driving up the market as well sort of absorbing any and all single family residences that they can get their hands on to leverage this crisis is there any thoughts or, or relevance there and are there any mechanisms and i don't know what that would look like i mean we're you know people are allowed to invest where they want to invest but do you i guess don do you see that as being a contributing problem or is that just is that peripheral and and not immediately at the root of the issues um uh you, i think you gave part of the answer it is extremely hard in america to govern who can buy and sell property it's considered a fundamental property right i can sell my property to whoever i want and i can buy property if i can afford to buy it uh, we don't regulate buying and selling. That may be a mistake, uh, but that is the way our economy operates. So, so yes, we are seeing a dramatic increase in investor ownership of housing. And, and because the housing in such a large plight, it drives up the price. And if I can outbid you for this house, I will, because uh, I know I can charge that rent and get it back. So now we just raised the rent because it was a bidding war to own a single family house. I don't really have a good answer for that, except uh, things like community land trusts that buy and own. And there are several in the Denver area that just make it their business to go out and buy houses to keep them off the speculative market. But that's mm -hmm. hard because that's nonprofits, that's individual. I mean, those are relatively small organizations to make a dent in this problem. It's gonna have to be a substantial percentage and they don't have enough money to outbid speculators. If Don wants to sell his house and I have a bid from you to put it in a community land trust and one from Dan to redevelop it as a McMansion, Dan's gonna offer me more money than you are probably. And it's very hard to stop that. So there are solutions, but they tend to not be powerful enough to get a great uh, leverage on this, uh, on yep. this problem. I appreciate the comments. I, I figured as much, but it, it seems to be contributing in some ways, um, yep. you know, from a cash position, being able to outbid anybody else. And I, I just was curious more than anything, what you had been hearing about that, Don, and, and how much of a problem you felt that was in this broader context of conversation. So thank you for that. And, and again, thank you, Dan, Ignacio, and Don. This was a really great conversation. I, I've learned a lot. Well, thank you. Um, you know, I will close with some thoughts. Uh, Thanking Don and Ignacia, but I'd really like to thank you, Wells, Vicki, and Brad for joining the conversation today. It's, I, I've enjoyed it, uh, certainly. One last uh, thought that I heard here in the last you know, five minutes, Vicki, thank you for your insight from Portland. And Don and Ignacio, I think you illustrate the need for this organization. It's interesting that we're having a conversation about Metro Denver and cities. But we're doing this with AI in Colorado, and I, I think maybe we need to kind of elevate this conversation as a state. And I want to reiterate a comment that someone you both made, Don and Ignacio, that I really love. I'm going to pin it up in our kitchen here that we aren't just making better architecture. I think you said we're making better cities. And as an AI Denver conversation that's relevant, I think maybe we could broaden that to say we should be committed to making better societies. And, um, you know, there's a lot of work to do that we've heard about today. Thank you both Don and uh, Ignacio for sharing everything. Uh, anything you'd, you'd like to add as we close out? Thanks again, everyone. I would add one thing and that is that uh, there is a group, I'm, I'm actually, it's a volunteer group called the Colorado Housing Affordability Project, CHAP, that has a website 
that put forward a platform last year in terms of uh, different, it's land use folks, it's academics, but it's only six self-appointed volunteers who put together a website and pushed ideas, some of which got into the inclusionary zoning legislation, which we're happy about. But it's gonna come up with version 2.0 of the platform very soon, like this week. And we're trying to push further reform at the state legislature or local governments, but, but in probably gonna be some of it at the state legislature. Uh, on affordability, because some of these things have to happen at the state, and so at the state level to be effective. So just be, if you're interested, you might get on the CHAP chat website. It's called, I think it's called cohousingaffordabilityproject.org. So there you go. Yeah, CO, Colo CO for Colorado, Housing Affordability Project. Uh, all I have to say is that I guess the revolution it really needs to happen on how we tax ourselves. Um, and, uh, you know, the idea that we're trying to get rid of our state income tax is just kind of going the wrong way. Um, uh, we, we, we need to think better how we're distributing our taxes, but uh, I think that the, uh, the only way that we can create that kind of equity is if we put more taxes on, our, uh, on, on solving this problem. You, I don't think that the market alone can do it. Fair point. Yeah, this is great. Well, again, thank you, everyone. I just want to give a quick reminder that October 6th through 9th is the AI Colorado Design Conference. It's virtual. Uh, it's much more accessible in that way to, to folks, uh, including people in Portland, Vicki. Mm -hmm. So you can go to AIColorado.org to learn more and sign up. And again, thanks, Don and Ignacio. Really sincerely appreciate your time and insight. Mm -hmm. Cheers.